Hello, good morning. Welcome to our coverage of Israel-Hamas war. I'm Alumide McCauley. Coming up today. Hamas health officials say at least 90 Palestinians killed in Israeli airstrikes on the Jabalia refugee camp in Gaza. Today's broadcast. Let's begin where plumes of thick, dark smoke rose over Gaza skyline as seen from the southern Israel on Sunday as heavy fighting continued in the Strip. The Gaza war triggered by a shock Hamas killing and terror kidnapping spree in South Israel on October the 7th has shaken regional and world powers as the Palestinian civilian toll spirals. While pledging to destroy Hamas, Israel has also sought to recover hostages held by the Iranian-backed group. Hamas health officials say at least 90 Palestinians have been killed in Israeli airstrikes on the Jabalia refugee camp in Gaza. Two Palestinians were also killed by the Israeli army in the West Bank. According to the Palestinian Health Ministry, a third man was reported to have died of wounds that he sustained a few days ago in the West Bank city of Jenin. The Israeli Army spokesperson unit said it was checking into the report and will issue a comment once it has made and has more information. At least 290 Palestinians have been killed in the West Bank over the past two months since October the 7th. <laughs> Meanwhile, Israeli forces battled Hamas. They said they uncovered an unusually large concrete and iron girded tunnel designed to carry out carloads of Hamas fighters from Gaza right up to the border. The tunnel ran down diagonally to a depth of 50 meters where it expanded to a relatively capacious 3 meters in height and width with electrical fittings. Chief Military Spokesperson Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari put the full length of the tunnel at 4 kilometers that's enough to reach into northern Gaza city. Once the heart of Hamas governance, and now a devastated combat zone. Generally, the tunnels shown to the media by the group or by the Israeli military after their discovery have been narrow and low, designed for single file movement of gunmen on foot. The tunnels shown by Mr. Hagari had shafts plunging vertically downward that he said suggested it was part of a wider network. We found in Gaza, the biggest secret of Sinwar, his project, his subterranean tunnel project, we're going to enter. It was a secret that we have revealed that was meant to target the crossing Now, we will be speaking with Mr. Stephen Hayes, President Emeritus, Corporate Council on Africa. He's also a former president, America Center on International Leadership Partner, as well of Gainful Solutions. Good morning, Mr. Hayes. Welcome to the program. Hey, good morning. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. The, the Gaza situation continues to uh, happen with an increasing reports of loss of life. As at this morning, another uh, number of, of Palestinians are said to have been killed because of the Israeli offensive. Can they help it because of all the challenges that they face in trying to counter Hamas who have embedded themselves in a civilian population with civilian infrastructure? 
Well, I think I think the solution to this is going to require the wisdom of Solomon, and I, I'm not even sure that would that would do it. Uh, obviously, there's going to be continuing to be a lot of deaths. Uh, is it are they necessary? It's hard to argue that they're necessary. Um, I, I would guess the the feeling is right now there's at least nineteen thousand dead confirmed. Uh, I suspect the number is going to be much higher when it's finished, uh, quite a bit higher. Seventy uh, percent of those are women and children. Uh, is it is it uh, inevitable? It, it shouldn't. Hamas clearly is using uh, the civilian population as as, as shields. Uh, no doubt about it. The uh, the issue, though, also too, is the Israelis haven't uh, actually been discreet in the time in the time of uh, war. It's very very difficult. So, uh, is, is it avoidable? Yes, if there's a uh, if there can be a truce, is the uh, truce possible? Probably. Uh, I understand that the negotiations are now on again uh, behind the scenes for some sort of truce, but it's 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 going to continue to be a mess. So Israel is made out to be the bad guy right now because of the increasing toll uh, of Palestinians who are losing their lives in the Gaza Strip. Do you think the measures that they have reported that they are taking are enough to offset that load? Because they've said that they've given out maps for people to go to safer destinations. They try as well to make sure that target precise uh, bombings are used so as to minimize casualties, but that doesn't seem to be working. I, I don't know that any war is uh, uh, ever going to minimize casualties. Uh, every, every war in size, side, uh, regardless uh, of war, goes back to saying we're trying to minimize civilian ca casualties. But when, when you have blind bombs, uh, when you have uh, mass destruction, civilian casualties are going to be an important part of it. I think also it's part, part uh, frankly, it, it may be part of the strategy. Uh, I think that uh, Netanyahu is, is committed to driving the Palestinians out as much as possible. Uh, and it's going to, and that's going to require a lot of civilian toll. Uh, so starvation starting to take place, according to UNRWA and other sources and the churches. Uh, that uh, and that's got to be part of the strategy too. You people can't get uh, uh, food relief in, uh, at least not sufficient food relief. So uh, it is again. It comes back to how avoidable is this? And I think that uh, right now Israel is losing the uh, PR battle on this. And that PR battle continues as the war continues. Israel says, as far as aid goes. The continuous supply is contingent on their ability of the aid agencies to continue to send in trucks that can be inspected by the IDF as one of the measures. And they say that the, they're dragging their foot in that regard. Well, I, I think that... Uh the, the aid uh, inspections are going to be slow anyway. I think the Isra Israelis will slow that down uh, significantly, partly out of their own security needs, partly as part of, part of strategy. And again, there's very few points of entry for aid, aid trucks at this time. But in, in uh, fairness, if fairness is, is a factor at all in this war, uh, Hamas has certainly uh, made it far more difficult as well uh, by holding the... Uh, uh, population, the civilian population essentially is captive as well. There simply is very, very little place, uh, very few places for the citizenry to retreat to unless they're driven into e Egypt, which I think uh, is increasingly part of uh, Netanyahu's strategy. But that's not going to happen either right now because Egypt is certainly not giving uh, entry to uh, refugees. Do you think Egypt should reconsider that position and accept refugees? I think it's. I think it's going to be very difficult for them. That's a very large population move. the The history is that once the uh, population has moved, they're not going to be able to return. So that's going to be a very large uh, contingent of Palestinians in Sinai. And what would that mean as well to Egypt? So I think that uh, Egypt has has uh, has that under consideration, and they're very very resistant to that politically. Also. Uh, it's 
it's uh, it would be in support of the Palestinians to keep them there, strain ironically, because they know that once they're gone, it's going to be very, very difficult to return. That's been the history since 1948. Is it realistic to suggest that Israel will cave in to the international pressure from the international community and the United Nations as far as withdrawal from Gaza and this incursion goes? I don't see that as particularly likely at this time, particularly given as long as Prime Minister Netanyahu is the is in fact the Prime Minister and the leader in his coalition still runs Israel. Uh, they are uh, committed uh, to uh, drive Hamas out. I think that's going to be essentially an impossibility because they're beginning it's alienating the Palestinian population uh, in any case uh, and in more support of Hamas in, in some ways. So I, I think that's going to be very, very uh, difficult. One of the tragic incidents that occurred over the last few days were the three Israeli uh, hostages that were killed by the Israeli people, the IDF, mistakenly. They escaped. They had survived 70 days plus of being held hostage only to be felled by their own people. Now, which is a, a tragedy on top of the other. This will infuriate the Israelis more, you think. And uh, what does that say of the IDF who immediately owned up to the mistake? Well, I, it, it is, uh, I think, good. I wouldn't say it's admirable, but it's certainly good that that the Israelis admitted it was their their mistake, but it doesn't change the fact that it's a Shakespearean tragedy of sorts. Uh, that that three people who have managed to survive for seventy days in extreme captivity, then only and finally we don't know how they found their way out, only to be killed by their own troops with uh, very clear signs that they were, first of all, speaking Hebrew, had a white flag, uh, and so you know how how does this happen? It does happen in in, in wars. Uh, soldiers are angry. Soldiers are afraid. Uh, soldiers are afraid that it's a trick. Uh, it's hard to see that this was much of a trick, but uh, it's strangely, sadly, understandable. Is, is it forgivable? Probably not. That was the um, explanation from the IDF. They said, the Israeli Defense Forces, that the, the <clears throat> Hamas have been known to try and uh, trick and use those sorts of decoys so that they could launch an attack against uh, uh, the Israeli troops or uh, be, do suicide bombing. So obviously, one who went to the war front with his life on the line to rescue those hostages as, as one of his objectives will not be found dead or caught dead trying to kill those same people deliberately. But let's look at the wider region now and the role of Iran and the role of your government in the United States in trying to uh, make sure that Iran's influence in the region does not, does not extend beyond what, what is happening right now. Is the United States soft on Iran? I don't think they're soft in, in Iran. I think there's not a lot of policy options on it. Uh, the policy options could be uh, fairly extreme. Uh, you know, and how how different uh, two weeks makes is that two weeks ago I was saying that the Republicans so far have have kept a lower profile on on uh, on Iran and the attacks on American troops, but that's changed over the last two weeks as well. So there's going to be pressure on the United States to take some action on Iran. Sanctions uh, really haven't done much uh, on this. Uh, they're perhaps useful, but uh, sanctions aren't, aren't the issue. Now, is, is uh, the United States preparing to put more troops in? Um, we don't we don't know for sure. Uh, they're certainly saying that they're putting more more uh, protection of the of the shipping and the shipping lanes. Uh, what they're going to do on other areas, particularly attacks from Lebanon, uh, attacks from Yemen, uh, remain remains to be seen. I'd still advocate restraint if the U.S. puts more troops in. Uh, that's obviously going to inflame the situation more. Uh, on the other hand. Uh, 
it does look uh, it makes it has the appearance of the U.S. being soft in Iran. Uh, clearly not soft in Iran, but the I think the policy options are somewhat limited at this stage, unless you want to expand the war significantly and expanding the war uh, to Iran or more directly with Iran in some ways is uh, is going to be I think catastrophic. What about replacing sanctions? Does this reinforce Senator Lindsey Graham, for instance, his position that his critics have to eat crow now because Iran seems to be uh, the puppet master behind some of these uh, incidents that are happening, allegedly? Well, I, I think there's little doubt that Iran is the, is, uh, if not the puppet master, certainly uh, the, the the supplier of the strings for the puppets, uh, the the supplier of materials, and again goes back to the enormous amount of weapons that Hamas has been able to store over several years. It's just mind boggling that uh, that they're able to fight this war so uh, so seemingly effectively right now. Uh, so uh, Iran Iran clearly is uh, I think playing a uh, depending on your point of view, a villainous role in the, in the area by keeping the uh, killing going uh, one way or another. Uh, but again, uh, there's got to be some negotiations. There's got to be talks to, to stop this. Uh, you cannot, uh, I think at this stage, contemplate going to war with Iran, which would be, I think, uh, a catastrophe again. Will, there, will sanctions that were lifted... Uh, against Iran, will that help to put pressure back on? San sanctions, really, I, I, that's one of my favorite subjects. I've never been really fond of sanctions. I don't think they're particularly effective. Uh, I think that they're, they're important statements. They, they certainly create more difficulties for various partners, but the Russians have found ways around the uh, sanctions. As long as you have other allies that are going to help you, who have supplies that can... can uh, supplement or replace what what was lost in sanctions uh iran has been able to operate fairly well over the years uh, under under extreme sanctions i think uh having any nuclear agreement again around with iran under the, and at the present stage is going to be very very difficult uh and uh it also goes back again to the to the role of, of the u.s which uh, you'd ask about and i really haven't uh, asked that i think that the, the U.S. influence goes up and down. Right now, they're a necessary uh, partner in all this, but their credibility with the rest of the world, I think, is weakening because they've seen such a, uh, given a, seemingly a blank check to Israel, and that's going to have uh, a lot of effect in the United States as well. Now, we know that as this crisis continues, and you mentioned it, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been uh, under the microscope of criticism lately. And it's been alluded that he is to blame in some of, or he takes some portion of the blame, and if he was out of the way, for instance, maybe Israel will take another tact. But isn't there even a danger, given the composition of the Knesset, that Benjamin Netanyahu, as the prime minister right now, is the best man for the job, and you won't find a more moderate politician who will be able to speak to the international community or take the decisions that people think will favor peace in Gaza? I think there are more reasonable human beings than Benjamin Netanyahu, given the composition of the Israeli government right now. It's, I think it's virtually impossible to replace him. His... Uh, he has a majority. His allies, the uh, two two minor parties, are essential to him. They they are, if anything, even more militant than Netanyahu. If it's hard to imagine, and so I don't think the situation is going to change. I think it's wishful thinking that Netanyahu would be replaced at this stage. Uh, the report, I think, in the New York Times, it was uh, maybe uh, the wrong source, but. Uh, is that he's even now contemplating run, running and preparing to run for another term. So um, would he be elected? Who knows? But I, I think that the, the reality is that it's, it's pointless to uh, wish for somebody else besides the prime minister. He is, he is in power right now. We, you need to deal with him. Uh, is that possible under the circumstances? Is he willing to uh, compromise on Hamas and is he, or... Uh, 
on the Palestinian solution. He's not going to support. It's very clear. Everyone now acknowledges it. Uh, I think a lot of people knew it a long time ago, but have refused to acknowledge it, that he's not in favor of a two-state two, uh, uh, solution. And so I don't think that's uh, even in the cards at this stage, even as as uh, many people think that that's the only solution. So I, I think it's... Uh, going to be very, very, very difficult to find a solution to this. I don't think the problem is totally intractable, but I think the the, dis, the deep distrust on both sides, or all sides, I should, the distrust between the, the Palestinian Authority and Hamas, the distrust between, uh, obviously, the Palestinian Authority and Netanyahu, and Netanyahu and Hamas makes this, uh, if not impossible, certainly it makes it very, very difficult to find any any solution. The distrust is just, I think, intractable. In the United States, is there a danger that U.S. support for Israel will wane? And how, do, how will that and how does that impact President Joe Biden's coming campaign? Well, I, I think it is waning. Uh, again, I want to put that in relative terms. I think that the support for Israel will remain fairly strong among the American public. But certainly the, the, the polls are... Uh, showing that, that that there's far more sympathy for the Palestinians than there ever has been. And again, that's still a, a minority, so I don't want to overstate that. But yes, it does present problems for Biden, particularly it presents a, a because states and ele our electoral system, it provide it uh, creates a special problem in Michigan for him. There's a very strong Arab population in Michigan. Michigan is an absolute critical state in the next election. So unless uh, there's some movement there, I think that he's in danger uh, in danger of losing Michigan, which would be uh, uh, a, a big blow to to the Biden uh, strategy for. Uh, winning the next election, uh, there's also weakening support for Biden in other in other states. But Michigan certainly is is probably the, most, the clearest example uh, of this war affecting his election chances. Finally, Mr. Hayes, how does that happen? A work that support will wane in that manner when there are many powerful figures in American politics across the whole spectrum who are either Jewish or married to a Jewish person or had a grandfather or a grandmother who was a survivor of the Holocaust, and so forth, even from the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken. There, there are, well, I think one of the surprising uh, statistics on this is that there are, there, there are many, there are as many Arab descendants as there are Jewish descendants in America. Uh, certainly the uh, Jewish lobby has been very powerful, uh, but it's not the only lobby in America. And, uh, so I, I think that when it comes down to sheer numbers in the end, uh, that uh, it's going to make it. There is differences, particularly again. I, I want to act, uh, emphasize uh, Michigan, but there are other states as well. Uh, the, the great myth, and it's unfortunate for the the Jewish population, is the Jewish population controls the elections. They don't. Uh, they are six million to ten million. People in America, out of 330 million, it comes down ultimately to the number of votes. Uh, but uh, certainly, it's an important lobby in the United States, uh, and there are there are emotional reasons for that. There's uh, also there's a lot of confusion on the on the nature of the of Israel now. Uh, education systems need to be, I think, much more aware of history. Uh, but, uh, for instance, I was reading yesterday that uh, uh, now uh, the majority of, uh, more than 50% uh, are unfamiliar with the Holocaust. Uh, so, uh, there just there, there's a lot of mystique, superstition, um, social media has not helped the situation, but uh, there, there is a myth of an all-powerful entity. It's not. It's just simply not the case. Otherwise, you, you would have the same party running, winning every every year. The the Jewish population is is as diverse in their political theory uh, feelings as almost anybody else. Indeed, we all need a history lesson. Can you imagine that even aside from not being familiar with the Holocaust, that a lot of people are not now, as it happens to be. Uh, there are questions as to, if you remember Attila the Hun, 
people are even asking questions. People want to name their children after Attila the Hun. That's like, mm -hmm. who was only a barbarian that raped and pillaged across the whole of Europe uh, back in the day. And it's like naming your child after Adolf Hitler. You know, so, and people are increasingly asking questions. Was he that bad? Was that situation that gross? But thank you, Mr. Hayes, for your contribution this morning. Mr. Stephen thank Hayes, you. President Emeritus, uh, Corporate Council on African Affairs, former President, American Center on International Leadership. Many thanks for coming today. Still ahead, German Air Force sends aid material to Egypt even as Israel opens Gaza aid crossing for the first time as ceasefire calls grow. We'll have that story and more after the break. Please stay with us. Welcome back. In the meantime, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed to fight to the end as new negotiations appear to be underway to recover hostages held by Hamas after a source said Israel's intelligence chief met the Prime Minister of Qatar, the country mediating on the Israel-Palestinian conflict. In his opening remarks at the start of a weekly cabinet meeting in Tel Aviv, Mr. Netanyahu read from a page where he said was a letter he received from families of fallen soldiers saying continuing the war against Hamas in Gaza was their will. Prime Minister Netanyahu told a press conference the war in Gaza was ex existential and must be fought until victory. He says Gaza will be demilitarized and Israel and under Israeli security control. Hamas killed over 1,200 people and captured 240 hostages in a surprise terror attack into Israel on October the 7th. Israel's counteroffensive has killed close to 19,000 people. That's according to Gaza Health authorities and left thousands buried under the rubble. Israeli and Palestinian representatives to the United Nations have made their case in favor and against a ceasefire before the General Assembly. Comments from Ambassador to the Permanent Observer Mission of the State of Palestine, Riyad Mansour, and the Israeli representative to the UN, Gilad Erdan, came after the General Assembly passed a resolution calling for a ceasefire on Tuesday. The resolution had 153 countries voting in favor and 23 abstaining. The U.S. and Israel, which argue a ceasefire only benefits Hamas, voted against the measure along with eight other countries. Those attempting to shame those who call for a humanitarian ceasefire, you have failed. The General Assembly spoke, the world spoke, 157, 153 countries spoke. Shame is on those who refuse to stand against atrocities. Thank you, Mr. President. There is no way to end the massacres of civilians, including children, at an unprecedented pace to address the occupation made humanitarian catastrophe of unprecedented scale except through a ceasefire. Consider the amendment distorts the essential aim. It also targets our present and future. Killing engineers and doctors and poets and academics. It also targets those who could document the crimes and inform the world, the journalists. We mourn one of those journalists, Samer Abu Dagga, wounded in an Israeli drone strike and left to bleed to death for six hours, while ambulance ambulances were prevented from reaching him. I should like to thank the distinguished rep Stop the genocide committed against the Palestinian people and their children. A humanitarian ceasefire means a terrorist saving ceasefire. We're not stupid. 
This resolution only seeks an end to the war against Hamas Nazis. Sorry for the words. You don't give a damn about Israel and our future. An end to the war means turning our backs on the hostages. It means ensuring Hamas's continued rule in Gaza. Thank you, sir. All a ceasefire secures is a future for the genocidal jihadists. It is only Hamas that this resolution is defending. Stop hiding your intentions behind your suits and diplomatic wording. Humanitarian ceasefire. This resolution has a distorted agenda. At least make this clear so to all member states. This resolution aims to keep Hamas in power. Period. President, Ireland Coast. Hours ago, just hours ago, Hamas rocket was fired towards the vicinity of the Temple Mount, Haram el Sharif. And the Iron Dome, Israel's Iron Dome, intercepted the missile and defended Al-Aqsa Mosque from Hamas. Think about this. Israel is defending Al-Aqsa Mosque from Hamas's missiles. French Foreign Affairs Minister Catherine Colonna has arrived in Israel for a one-day visit during which she will meet with Israeli and Palestinian leadership as well as families of Israel, French hostages held by Hamas in Gaza. Israeli Foreign Minister Eli Cohen welcomed his counterpart at Israel's international Ben Gurion Airport and thanked Ms. Colonna and French President Emmanuel Macron for their support for Israel. Ms. Colonna landed in Israel hours after the French Foreign Ministry said one of its workers had died as a result of wounds sustained during an Israeli attack in Rafah in the strip of the Gaza Strip in the south of the Gaza Strip, an attack France has condemned. The French Foreign Affairs Minister also met with her Palestinian counterpart, Riyad al-Maliki, in Ramallah, the West Bank, to reiterate French calls for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza. Now we have... Dr. Ambrose Iwoke, Chairman, Guild of Public Affairs Analysts and Enogu State Chapter, who joins us virtually from the southeastern region of Nigeria, Enogu State. Good morning and welcome to the program, sir. Good morning, Olubide, and compliments of the Christmas season. Compliments of the season to you. We hope for a Christmas devoid of war, but that seems to be a tall order at this time. Dr. Iwoke, Israel says genocidal October 7 attack in their territory. The Palestinians and the United Nations, some of whom say genocidal, the same words, what Israel is trying to do in Gaza. Who is being genocidal? Well, uh, well uh, you know, the word genocidal is, uh, is a language that is being used when a particular group of uh, uh, people, be it a race or a tribe or an ethnic group, uh, is uh, you know being wiped off by uh, massive killings. Uh, that is what is uh, a genocide. Um, so um, uh, Israel cannot call what happened on the seventh of October a genocide. Uh, it was uh, it was a, it was an evil attack on Israelis uh, citizens that were uh, not uh, you know armed in any way that were free in a time of uh, peace were attacked, you know, by, uh, you know, unscrupulous elements terrorists and killed, some of them kidnapped. Um, but uh, that does not qualify as genocide in the uh, strictest sense of the word, uh, genocide. Um, genocide, this massive, like what happened uh, in Rwanda, uh, for example, in the, uh, between the Hutus and the Tutsis, uh, is called genocide. And uh, what happened uh, during the Second World War, uh, uh, the Holocaust, is uh, uh, it can be called genocide. Uh, what happened uh, during the Biafra Nigerian War, where uh, over uh, estimated over a million people were killed, is genocide. Uh, so um, neither side we call this war genocidal, but it's a it's a word that can be used to uh, carry sympathy. But at the same time, the number of deaths that have been witnessed is uh, is very massive uh, in this time because. 
and the wall is going to it has turned to a full scale uh, war where I don't think that kind of um, a war that is almost two years old uh, that is the war between uh, Ukraine and uh, uh, Russia. I don't think they have that kind of uh, uh, you know the number of casualties, even though the war is almost running two years now. Uh, but this is just a war for just two months, and uh, you know two and a half months, and we are having this kind of huge number. So uh, it is it, it's cause for worry, and uh, I think uh, Israel now uh, the reasons they are giving uh, cannot be sustainable. Uh, we agree that uh, it's a self defense because um, uh, the Hamas is still shooting uh, down, uh, shooting uh, missiles into Israel, still killing their people, still uh, posing an uh, existential threat to Israel. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Israel needs to now start, uh, change tactics. Uh, they need to enter a kind of more of uh, asymmetric warfare because this warfare is not uh, is not direct. Um, the Hamas people are using uh, uh, the citizens of uh, Palestine as human shield building military bases, tunnels, and other things that Israel has uh, made us uh, know uh, through uh, some videos. Uh, so whatever Israel now knows that whatever hits it does, it was affect civilians because these military uh, bases are inside civilian enclave. So what Israel needs to start doing is actually try to see how these uh, direct, uh, you know, uh, warfare, linear warfare, what they are doing now is linear warfare. What is so that guys are starting asymmetric warfare. So they are hitting the uh, civilian targets and the rest. So what they need to do is see how they can bring this operation to a close, and then use they have some of the best intelligence uh, gathering, uh, uh, you know, group or sad in the, in the in the whole wide world. So the, the Mossad can get to work and now start using intelligence gathering to start, you know, removing uh, the uh, powers and capabilities of uh, Hamas uh, by you know blocking the tunnel. If they suspect a, a base, for example, of uh, you know harboring uh, Hamas uh, terrorists or using a military base, they can evacuate that place and then neutralize it. I think that should be the uh, the game, uh, the operation uh, henceforth. But now bombarding the whole city and people, I think the the it is now not more effective. Uh, they, they need to uh, look at a more proactive measures. On the other hand, the world. And the uh, United Nations that are condemning this also should start condemning uh, where it's a war crime to use civilians as a human shield. And that is what Hamas has consistently used. Uh, that is all over the world. You have military bases away from civilian population, especially. But here we are having Hamas committing war crime, even in the time of peace, by installing their military bases inside civilian population, therefore exposing the, human, uh, the civilian population to danger. So, uh, as we are condemning Israel, we have to condemn Hamas method. And the one should ensure that Hamas no longer uses that method of uh, military operation because these are the kind of casualties that will come up if they're going to be a retaliation. Let's even imagine for a second that Hamas military bases are in the desert. They are not inside human population. It could have been a direct confrontation between the IDF and Hamas fighting themselves out. So, soldier to soldier, military to military bases. But now, because these things are embedded in civilian population, that's why we're having such number of civil and casualties. So, uh, at both ends, should be condemned, and then the world should come down hard on both sides and see how we can stop it, and then ensure that uh, Hamas doesn't do what it does, and that Israel uses more of intelligence gathering to, you know, try to take out uh, Hamas uh, uh, military operations. Israel has expressed a reservation that. Hamas have reiterated that they, want, they will conduct another strike as they did on October 7th again, and that their policy remains to destroy Israel. If you take that on board and Israel are asked to down their arms, will, will, will it be seen as victory for Hamas? Uh, well, nobody is telling Israel to uh, put down its arms because no nation that have existential threat like Israel will put down their arms. Uh, I mean, uh, Hamas has made it clear they want Israel out of the map in that area. And they want to wipe out the whole of Israelis. So that is an existential threat. That is an affront. That is a genocidal statement. Uh, Israel, on the other hand, will not see that. But what, we are, what, what I'm advocating is that it just will change tactics uh, from what has been what I've been doing for after October 7 events. The tactics needs to change because... Uh, the world is getting worried of uh, the number of casualties. And because most of these people killed are not uh, the, the, the Hamas people, they are actually the Palestinians. And then you have made their point 
they have routed the child, they have done their mapping, they have taken over some area of some, of some territories. So those territories being taken over should be now be controlled by Israel. So Israel should rather look at more of a, a solution where they can be in charge of security as they have postulated that the post-war uh, Gaza Strip will be run by maybe militarily Israel, not politically. And then they can now start looking at a solution where they you know, sustain that till Hamas capabilities are greatly depleted and they're demobilized. And in that way, they can now uh, go out after some years. But continuous bombardment, area bombardment of uh, of the, this uh, civilian population area, I, I think uh, the use is uh, is out for now because this is exactly what Hamas wants. They are they, they are playing into the cards of Hamas. Hamas wants the world to be sympathetic towards them. Uh, the, Hamas wants the world to con con condemn Israel, and uh, so Israel is actually playing into the hands of uh, Hamas propaganda and the rest. And if people are getting worried, uh, even the uh, yeah, the a country like the United States of America is trying to say, okay, but you still have your hostages uh, with these guys. Why not try to bring out your hostages first? And then you cannot do uh, you know, a prolonged military operation that is not a, a linear warfare and bombardment, but based more on intelligence and precision strike, which Israel is uh, you know, good at and well known for. And that is the process that no, uh, we should go on forward, but not uh, this direct uh, you know, confrontation on a civilian environment. Israel cannot afford to put down its arms. What do you make of the construction of the tunnels underneath Gaza, one of which we, sh we showed at the beginning, at the, at the top of the program, where there are tunnels that are as wide as they can take a car, and there are tunnels that are as deep uh, longitudinally up to 50 meters, latitudinally 500 meters, and the the sophistication and the effort that they put into establishing these tunnels speaks of their intentions for for many years to come well like i said earlier i think going forward uh if we the world, the world is able to persuade israel to stop the bombardment israel the world should allow israel and give the latitude for Israel to take up that gaza area uh, uh militarily but uh, not politically. In that way, uh, you know, they can be able to uh, identify more tunnels, be able to go into them, be able to destroy them, be able to pick out Hamas commanders, will be able to, you know, neutralize all efforts to build uh, more capabilities, and then be able to now secure their territory. Because when you secure Hamas, uh, when you neutralize Hamas, uh, Israel will be more safe, will be more safer. Uh, and then, when you also de degrade the capability of Hamas, you also degrade the capability to endanger the people of Palestine. Because it is both ways. Uh, while Hamas is also dealing with Israel, they are dealing with their own people, they are dealing with the people of Palestine. Imagine the number of casualties that have taken place. The Hamas, most of their commanders are not even in the country. Their children and family uh, and them themselves are living outside the country while they are uh, wasting uh, uh, the lives of Palestinians. Uh, so the, the the tunnels themselves can be you know can be destroyed. What we are also saying, some people have also accused the Israeli government that with all the intelligence capability of the Israeli government, how come that such an attack could take place and they were not aware? So something must also be wrong uh, with the administration over there. So Benjamin Netanyahu and his group should also look at what was the intelligence failure that made that happen. And uh, so these are the things Israel needs to start asking itself. I start also using more of intelligence to detect some more of these, uh, you know, tunnels that are strewn all over Palestine. And I don't think it's that we pretend that uh, it doesn't know that these tunnels exist. Uh, so why is there no more made efforts in the past to eliminate them is uh, uh, left for conjecture. But at this stage, they have to intensify efforts and removing the uh, uh, tunnels, but not the way it is being done now. Uh, Israel has made a loud statement to the Hamas that it, it will be dead to it, that they cannot toy with the lives of their citizens, and that should make sure that all those who are still uh, held captives are released. Then they can now enter into military operations that are not of this scale, uh, but more of intelligence and uh, you know, precision strikes. I think that should be what uh, is uh, happening. When you degrade Palestine, Hamas, they will not be able to shoot rockets into Israel. And that has to be done systematically and in covert way not this uh, area bombardment. I think this, uh, the area bombardment and this full military operation has done its work and uh, Israel should re-strategize. Do you, 
What, in your view, is uh, Hamas' estimation of Arab support? Do you think they miscalculated or overestimated the support of the certain Arab nations uh, who have not been involved and who, by their posture, does not seem they want to be involved? And if you count the Houthis in Yemen and Hezbollah in Lebanon, they're showing some measure of support, but certainly not enough to take the fight to Israel. I think the Arab world is tired. Uh, the Arab nation is tired of being dragged into uh, all this kind of ceaseless war. Remember, uh, uh, they were dragged into the war in the 60s. Remember, they were dragged into the war. I think in 1967, for example, when the, when the, the Joy Golan Heights were, were, was lost, uh, they were also dragged into the war, uh, the Yom Kippur War. They were dragged into so many wars. Uh, you know, and they suffered the consequences. So I think now, they are very tired. I mean, every country is struggling uh, economically. People want to strengthen the economic base. People want their country to be uh, better. So dragging them into was spending huge resources, use a uh, huge expenditure, huge financial uh, involvement. Most countries don't want to do that. And if you notice, the Arab world is opening up to the world. Uh, they, they, they want, uh, sorry, Dubai, the United Arab Emirates. You can see what they have transformed in the last 30 years. You know, being tourism base of the world. We can see what Saudi Arabia is doing with reforms, allowing women to drive cars, doing a lot of things, uh, opening up, up the football league to the world. So trying to attract destination beyond the oil. So they, they don't want, the Arab nation does not want to be dragged into a war caused by a recalcitrant group like Hamas. So uh, they are being cautious. And that is why a country like Qatar is doing negotiation, trying to bring uh, uh, both parties, uh, you know, negotiating for uh, the release of uh, hostages and the rest. And that is the role they have been playing, uh, for, apart from Iran, uh, basically, who is still, uh, you know, very recalcitrant, uh, sending weapons. And uh, the other countries, they have been talking tough, but you can see they have not made any commitments in terms of weapons, in terms of uh, whatever that, I mean, they have not made any official pronouncements to, uh, to that effect. That shows you uh, that they are or like what I was happy where they were militarily involved, where, to, where they were contributing men, where they were contributing armory, where they were con uh, contributing uh, finances uh, openly. But now you can see that uh, everybody's cautious. Uh, so that is the new thinking over there. Uh, instead of war war with these guys, let's judge on and say, sol and say a solution. And that is the, you know, the track that the Arab nations are taking currently. Indeed, discretion is the better part of valor. Thank you. Dr. Ambrose Iwoke, who joined us from Enogu, a Guild of Public Affairs Analysts, Enogu State Chapter, the chairman. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Lumide, for having me. Still to come on the program today, families and supporters of hostages still held in Gaza demand Israel present an offer to Hamas leaders to return their loved ones unharmed. More details later. Please join us again. Welcome to the final half of this morning's coverage of Israel-Hamas war. A top Palestinian authority says, before we go there, yes, a top Palestinian of official says all Palestinian factions, including Hamas, must take a serious look at the failure of their policies to achieve freedom for their people once the war between Israel and Hamas is over. 63-year-old Hussein al-Sheikh is the general secretary of the president Mahmoud Abbas Palestinian Liberation Organization and is seen by some as a potential successor. His comments were the first time a senior PLO leader has talked publicly about Hamas tactics since the October 7 attacks triggered the relentless bombardment and ground war that has killed at least 19,000 Palestinians, displaced hundreds of thousands and left much of the enclave in ruins. Mr. Sheikh also acknowledges the political path under Oslo Peace Accords was faltering as it currently stands, would not achieve the ambition of the Palestinian people for the establishment of a Palestinian state within the pre-1967 borders. He added that the Palestinian Authority was the legitimate representative of the Palestinian people and would be ready to take control of Gaza after the war.
He says the Palestinian Authority has been weakened by Israel's military raids and expansion of settlements. However, he recognizes that the unpopular Palestinian Authority, which many Palestinians see as corrupt, undemocratic, and out of touch, needed to reassess its role. Hamas, by contrast, has grown in popularity since the attacks in Gaza and the West Bank, according to a Palestinian poll. German Air Force loaded relief material onto a cargo plane at a German military airport for a delivery to the Cairo International Airport in Egypt as Israel opened the Gaza aid crossing for the first time as ceasefire calls grow. The German army received an order from the German Foreign Office on short notice. Colonel Christian John told the press, adding that it was a routine flight and that the army was happy to carry out the mission. According to the colonel, the cargo consists of 7.6 tons, including incubators and ventilators for newborns and small children, as well as 100 monitors for patients and other medical material. The relief cargo will be received by the German embassy and delivered to hospitals in Egypt set to treat patients from the Gaza Strip. Hundreds marched through Barcelona under the weekend during a protest in solidarity with Palestinians. Many held Palestinian flags and participated in chants calling for Palestine to be freed. Spain, Ireland and Belgium and Malta want EU leaders to debate the situation in Gaza and have jointly called for a lasting humanitarian ceasefire that will end the conflict. need to keep on taking the streets in order to push our governments, to push politicians to end complicity with Israeli apartheid and with the massacres Israeli is committing against the Palestinian people. And specifically in the Spanish state, we're seeing that the Spanish government is being one of the voices that's being more critical about Israel's um, murder and massacre against the Palestinian people, but it's not enough. And finally on the program, family and supporters of hostages still held in Gaza demanded Israel present an offer to Hamas leaders to return their loved ones unharmed. The freed hostage, uh, a freed hostage, Raz Benami, said in the news conference that she warned the Israeli cabinet that the fighting in Gaza will harm the hostages. She added Israel must offer another hostage release deal and get the international community to support it. The families gathered in Tel Aviv a day after three hostages were mistakenly killed by Israeli forces in Gaza. More than 100 women, children, teenagers and foreigners were released in a deal struck in late November. Others have been declared dead by Israeli authorities. Officials say more than 100 hostages remain in Gaza. Stay with Channels Television for all the news on the Middle East conflict and the crisis and the war between Israel and Hamas. That's it for this coverage this morning. Thanks for watching. I'm Illuminate McCauley. Have a good day. Our web